So, hello everyone. Good morning. Hello to everyone who is here. Thank you for being present. And hello to everyone who is following, uh, following us online. And welcome to our session, who is titled Beneath the Shadows, Private Surveillance in Public Spaces. The general idea uh, of the session for us is to discuss a little bit uh, the role of the private sector in surveillance uh, solutions and public security solutions. So we are here uh, trying to cover in general how uh, the private sector has been being present in civil so in public security and surveillance solutions and the risks, the implications of that, and which safeguards are important. Uh, for today's panel, we will have uh, three online speakers. Unfortunately, our on-site speaker uh, was not able to be present today, uh, Stella Aranha. But they, we will have three online speakers, uh, plus Barbara Simão, who is the head of research in Privacy and Surveillance and Internet Lab and who is also be introducing a little bit the subject. So I will introduce briefly Barbara and pass the word for her so she can give us an overview of the topic. And afterwards, we will pass to our, to our online speakers. So Barbara is the head of research, as I mentioned, for privacy and surveillance at Internet Lab. Internet Lab is a think tank on digital rights and internet policy, which is based in Brazil. Uh, she holds a master degree in law and develop development from the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Sao Paulo, and she graduated in law on the Faculty of Law at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, she was an exchange student at the Paris <coughs> Pantheon Sorbonne. She worked as a researcher in the field of digital rights at the Brazilian Institute of Consumer Defense between 2017 and 2020. And she also served as a counselor for the digital health data protection at Fio, Tech Fiocruz. So Barbara, the floor is yours. Hello everyone. Good afternoon, actually good. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on the time zone you're at. Um, as Eloisa mentioned, I'm Barbara and I'm head of research for privacy and surveillance at Internet Lab. And first of all, I'd like you, I'd like to thank you so much for coming here, for being present. And I will give you just a brief overview of what we are talking about and why we decided this would be an interesting topic for discussion. Um, I'll just share my screen because I have a few images that I would like to show you. Um, let's see if this goes smoothly. I think you're being able to see it, right? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so, well, the topic of the session is private surveillance in public spaces, and Eloise already um, mentioned and introduced a bit of what we are talking about. But I just like to give you an overview of what's happening in Brazil uh, that make us that made us think that it was interesting to bring this topic to discussion today. So, in the past couple years, we are seeing the growth of these private companies called Gabriel, Yellowcam, and well, different names for one same kind of business. That is. These companies that sell private solutions, private cameras, private totems with cameras that with well 24/7 ability to to access them, and that are shared between neighborhoods. So any group of neighbors, any type of local community can buy a camera or uh, access them by a monthly fee, and they are installed into a public street. So they are offering these totems or cameras that can be uh, easily accessed by anyone. I bring here some of the ex excerpts of their websites. Uh, it is in Portuguese, but I will translate it to you. Um, in general, they say, they claim that, I'll just see if I can point 
so it's more clear. Oh, okay. In general, they claim that modern cameras, they are uh, solutions for security anywhere. Uh, they claim that their mission is to make streets, neighborhoods, and cities more intelligent to protect anyone inside and outside the home. And yellow cam, one of these cameras, includes, includes, includes say the app to access the cameras is 100% free. Uh, the download can be made by anyone in Play Store or Apple Store. And in the app, it's possible to locate and uh, city map the cameras installed and visualize the images in real time 24 seven. And it's even possible to search for images that were uh, took in different times or dates. Uh, they claim also that the installation of these cameras can make the region safer and uh, they can be accessed by the public, public authorities, including the police. And they claim the tendencies for the tendency with the cameras is that it can decrease criminality rates from the regions, from these regions over time. So they're basically selling this 24 seven solutions that can be acquired by local communities, by uh, a group of neighbors, and that can be accessed without any kind of oversight and accountability. And that was what's concerning for us. And also the fact that some news, um, a new species here in Brazil announced that these companies were having private channels of communications with the police station. So the police stations weren't actually um, demanding a warrant to, uh, to access the images held by these private companies. They were accessing it almost like real time because of these private channels of communications that were, ha ha uh, that were existing between the companies and the public authorities. So we think this is um, uh, an important co topic for us to cover because uh, it can pose uh, an amount of risks for privacy and human rights. Uh, it can have impacts on transparency and data sharing between private and public bodies. And besides that, it can even affect the right to the city, considering the fact that surveillance may affect um, in the biggest in a bigger form certain groups of people that are already excluded and this case is somewhat relatable to what happened within the Clearview AI case uh, which for those who are familiar familiar with it it was a company that held a, a database based with over three million billion images obtained through data scrapping so they data scratched public bases of images and they uh, shared these images with police stations over the world for identification and resolution of criminal criminal cases. And these, uh, these images were collected without any kind of information, without any kind of oversight, and there weren't, and there were, there wasn't any kind of uh, accountability about the company's practices, practices and it was a case that caught the world's attention because Clearview AI actually became fined by many different jurisdictions because the, the lack of legal grounds on it was it was doing it. So I think the session is to discuss these topics, is to discuss uh, the relation between public security, criminal procedure, and these private surveillance solutions that are arising. And not only in Brazil, but many countries have these home security solutions that are already, that are also being um, sold. So I think it's important for us to discuss it, having the lens of the impacts it can have to privacy and human rights and for transparency. So we prepared a few policy questions for you. And uh, in general, we want to understand what are the broader societal implications of expensive surveillance and their impacts on human rights. How does private surveillance affect historically marginalized groups? How does the lack of transparency required from private surveillance companies affect human rights? What are the dangers concerning third party sharing with other private institutions or public authorities without transparency? What are the liabilities that insufficient legal protections regarding the shared use of data posed to individuals and groups? And does the, regulator, the current regulatory landscape for privacy and data protection give us sufficient protections to ensure 
the enforcement of human rights and equitable access to public spaces. So these are a few questions we prepared for today's session. And these are a lot of questions to discuss only one hour. So without further ado and giving this brief introduction, I would like to pass the floor to Beth Curley, who will join, who also join us for this panel. And um, Eloisa, I think you um, present her, right? Yes, so Beth Curley, uh, thank you for joining us today. Bad is a program officer with the research and conference section of the National Endowment for Democracy International Forum for Democratic Studies. She was previously associated editor of the Journal of Democracy and holds a PhD in history from Harvard University and a Bachelor of Science in Foreign Services from Georgetown University. Thank you, Bad, for being here today and the floor is yours. Beth, can you hear us? Hi. Um, sorry, I was muted. Um, Barbara, I think you need to unmute my video as well. I oh, now, now we are hearing you. <laughs> yes, um, I'm able to unmute my audio, but not my video. Um, I guess I can start talking, and perhaps my face will show up uh, later on in the proceedings. Um, so, um, Thanks, Barbara, and um, thanks, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but really looking forward to this discussion. Um, and so, uh, Barbara, that was really fast. I hadn't seen those slides before, but I think um, those cases that you shared are really great illustrations of some of the broader points I was hoping to make here. And so, um, uh, oh, there, I have video too. Um, and so um, I think what I'm going to do in these remarks is first try and situate those examples in some broader global trends that we've been tracking um, and also highlight how the potential abuse of emerging technologies like biometric surveillance in connection with cameras in public spaces um, poses additional risks. So to frame the comments a little bit, in an essay on what he calls Subversion Inc., Rod Debert at Citizen Lab has written about the risks from surveillance vendors making more widely available to both government and private clients capabilities that would previously have been available to just a few well-resourced states. His focus in that article is on the profound challenges to democracy from commercial spyware, which tracks us through the devices that we carry with us. But I would argue that this question of the growing accessibility spread and if you like democratization, quote unquote, of surveillance technologies and their intertwining with the broader surveillance capitalist ecosystem very much applies to the devices that other people place in the physical world around us as well. And in that regard, there are three main points that I'd like to cover. First, network surveillance of physical spaces is rapidly emerging alongside traditional digital surveillance as a pervasive reality that changes the conditions for engaging in public life and exposes people to targeting by both public and private entities. Second, emerging technologies such as biometric surveillance or so-called emotion recognition are enabling the entities that control cameras in public spaces to do new things with them. And third, Commercial suppliers play a crucial role in the spread of physical surveillance technologies to both public and private sector clients, and their involvement, um, as Barbara very correctly stated, presents challenges to enforcing transparency and accountability norms. So on the growth of surveillance cameras, already in 2019, there was an estimate that by 2021, which is two years ago, the number of surveillance cameras installed globally would exceed 1 billion. A significant number of those cameras, more than half, are in the People's Republic of China, but established and emerging democracies are also home to staggering numbers of cameras. Those include smart home cameras, as well as cameras that have been installed in commercial settings, um, which was traditionally an anti-theft measure, but now you see commercial entities installing surveillance as actually a kind of consumer convenience, letting people skip the checkout line to have their faces scanned instead. 
the line between public and private surveillance can be very thin. Um, so the system that Barbara described would be a perfect example of that. Um, in India, there's similarly an app that lets citizens share footage from their private CCTVs with the police, and that's just one of many cases. Those kinds of partnerships can reflect genuine public concerns about crime, but they also raise challenging questions on how privacy and anti-discrimination safeguards can be applied when law enforcement functions get outsourced to untrained citizens. Private citizens can, of course, themselves also misuse access to CCTV, for instance, to digitally stalk strangers or acquaintances or to engage in blackmail. But the blurry line between public and private surveillance also works the other way around, by which I mean to say that the private vendors who supply surveillance tech to public entities play an important role that's increasing as that tech itself gets more complicated. For instance, when companies sell smart city packages, their selling points, strengths, and profit logic can play a large role in determining what's included as part of those packages. Some great reporting from Access Now has shown how companies like Dahua have incentivized officials in Latin America to adopt their surveillance tools by offering so-called donations. And finally, vendors after the point of adoption can become very closely involved in managing the tools and of course the data from public surveillance projects. So simple CCTV cameras present plenty of risks, but the new AI tools that researchers like IPPM have identified as the drivers of the video surveillance market are multiplying these risks by letting people make sense of the images that are captured quickly and at scale. In a 2022 report for the forum, Steve Feldstein identified 97 countries where surveillance technologies involving AI are in use. And I think it's safe to say, given all the trends around us, that that number has since grown. Facial recognition technologies are probably the most widely discussed uh, quote unquote enhancement to surveillance cameras. Um, and they might be sold as part of the package together with cameras for so-called live facial recognition. But facial recognition can also be applied to ordinary camera footage after the fact using software from private vendors like Clearview AI, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and the risks of facial recognition have been pretty widely discussed. I think it's the best known type of AI surveillance. So just to very quickly recap, when it doesn't work, facial recognition can lead to false arrests, a harm that has very specifically affected Black communities in both North and South America, as documented by Joy Bolamwini and others. And when it does work, facial recognition, alongside other forms of biometric surveillance like voice or gait recognition, make it much easier to use cameras to track specific individuals. This again has potentially legitimate purposes, but it can very easily lend itself to political abuses, as with the abuse to track and identify protesters and dissidents in Russia and Belarus, which we've already seen. And it also puts the potential for private citizens to abuse facial recognition technology in greater reach. So also in Russia, there was a widely publicized lawsuit in 2020 that started when an activist was able to buy images tracking her own movements from the city's facial recognition system on the black market for just $200. There are slightly different challenges presented by emotion recognition technology, which doesn't focus on someone's identity per se, but tries to infer their emotional state based on facial cues. Analysts have very sharply criticized this approach as pseudoscience, and it's also not hard to understand the ways in which it might be abused to ensure at least the perception of conformity with government policies, but there's still a strong commercial interest in that kind of technology whether to monitor students, drivers, and criminal suspects in China, or to test and target ads in Brazil and the United States. And again, we see this kind of technology actually installed in public spaces so that the billboard is looking back at you, so to speak. Um, and finally, AI means that surveillance cameras in public spaces aren't working on their own. Analytical tools can combine information from biometric surveillance tech with information from other online and offline sources like shopping records or government databases to build profiles of people or of groups. On an aggregate level, all this information collection can both exert a chilling effect and enable abusive behaviors by data holders, both public and private. Um, and just to go through a few of those, first profiles of people and groups can be the basis for targeted information operations meant to deceive and polarize something that Samantha Hoffman has worked on. As Kathy O'Neill has described, profiles can enable discrimination, whether in the form of withholding state resources, 
targeting advertisements in a way that disadvantages certain people or through negative treatment by law enforcement. Third, digital rights activists worry that the mere presence of biometric surveillance in public spaces, and this would certainly extend to cameras more generally, whether or not they're working, can have a chilling effect on people's willingness to attend public protests, journalists' ability to meet with sources, and other vital civic activity. And finally, profiles can enable governments to track people's behavior in minute detail and exercise control through subtle systems of rewards and penalties in the manner that is somewhat loosely envisioned by China's social credit initiatives. So finally, why does it matter that private companies are so deeply involved in surveillance? I think whether we're talking about genuinely private surveillance or public-private partnerships, there are a few basic challenges, and these include, first, uh, data access. So vendors who partner with governments on surveillance projects are likely to have a commercial interest in keeping the data that's collected, and that's all the more true as companies are seeking to train and refine AI tools that depend on data. Democratic governments, on the other hand, have an interest in following principles like data minimization and purpose limitation for data collection. Um, and in the uh, project um, that we worked on together as part of the Forum Smart Cities report, I know Barbara and her co-author, Blenda Santos, pointed out that a lot of the ICCT contracts that she was seeing in Brazil did not have specific provisions on how those private partners could use the resulting data. And that kind of gap is a broader trend, which raises a lot of risks that vendors may be reusing data, which perhaps there was some privacy infringement, but it was collected for a public purpose that was so important it was worth it. But then it gets reused by commercial companies for reasons that would not have justified that infringement, or it may get resold through the ecosystem of data brokers or even shared with foreign governments if we're talking about foreign companies that are operating in different countries. Second, transparency. Public institutions in democratic societies are at least in theory supposed to follow transparency norms, whereas private companies are not subject to the same rules and they're naturally going to be inclined to try to protect their intellectual property. This can make it difficult for citizens, NGOs, and journalists to find out about how the surveillance systems that are watching them work. And I would argue that this is going to become a more important issue as surveillance technologies themselves get more complex and need to be evaluated for issues like encoded bias. And finally, when private surveillance feeds into public surveillance, it can be difficult to maintain clear lines of accountability for abuses. Again, these challenges are likely to grow as citizens experience infringements, such as unfavorable government decisions that they can't be, have explained that are made by inscrutable technologies based on a mix of public and private data that's been collected about them. So private surveillance, especially in an age where the trend is toward cloud-based and AI-enabled surveillance, is very deeply entwined in a broader surveillance ecosystem that crosses boundaries of sector, of country, and of the physical and the digital world. And that ecosystem is enabling new types of infringements on human rights. We see these being taken to an extreme in authoritarian settings, but they're relevant to all of us as we grapple with ways in which technology is changing the landscape for privacy. And these risks really raise the urgency, especially with private actors playing such a large role of multi-stakeholder engagement to develop new guardrails for democratic rights in a world where incredibly powerful surveillance tech is now in easy reach for, go for governments, companies, and even private people. Um, and on the question of solutions, since I think I'm about at my time, I am going to shamelessly turn things over to the next speaker in hopes that uh, they will provide some answers. Um, so again, thanks very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much for the rich contributions to this discussion. And now uh, I will pass to Swati Punya. Swati. Uh, is a technology policy researcher based in New Delhi, India. She is a lawyer by training and has earned certificates in digital trade and technology, cyber law, and corporate law. Currently, she works with the Center for Communication Governance, an academic research center based in the National Law University of Delhi, on issues that lie at the intersection of technology, law, and policy, and society. 
Her focus areas include privacy, data protection, data governance, and emerging technologies. At present, she is examining the non-crypto blockchain ecosystem in India and studying its potential for addressing socioeconomic challenges, creating inclusive in governance models and embedded in privacy in the context of developing countries of the global south. Prior to joining CCG, Swati worked with a leading southern voice on fostering consumer sovereignty in digital economy. Swati, thank you for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Papa and Elisa. Um, it's so lovely to be on the same panel as all of you. Um, and thank you to Beth for laying down such an apt and uh, elaborate impact and implications of surveillance. And I think that allows me to deep dive into the question that was um, asked of me, which is essentially like, what are the social inequalities and the discrimination, uh, you know, regarding these kind of surveillance acts and what can civil society uh, do in terms of uh, bridging some of these big cracks and loops that we are seeing in the society develop. Um, I think to just sort of hinge it to what Barbara was mentioning that's happening in uh, Brazil is not a standalone thing. We're seeing that happen across the world uh, and India is unfortunately not behind any of these trends. We're emulating all of these trends that we're seeing in terms of automating surveillance. And a number of states that I, I, I know were named as like the biggest surveillance um, states in the world, not just in the country. Uh, it seems like every state in India is sort of in a race and competing to automate surveillance. That seems to be the top priority. Um, having said that, the good part is the civil society has been an active player uh, and being start studying and researching and looking at this development. And they do sort of move to courts in the last couple of years that we're seeing when we see these kind of instances come up and rise. Um, but I think essentially what uh, I want to highlight is that given that you have all of these uh, instances happening and you have, um, you know, these kind of systems put in place, uh, the most important thing is the public-private partnership aspect. Often we're seeing these public-private partnerships sort of add efficiency. But here, I think the main question that is to what end and for what purpose? Uh, no, they're not just deployed uh, in sort of developing the technology for the state uh, and deploying it, but they often are also involved in management of it and sort of um, upgrading the systems. Uh, and nobody really, this is to anybody's guess, nobody really knows uh, how they're involved in with the data management or whether they're not. Nobody knows. Nobody knows that when a police is sort of stopping a person on the road for like random, uh, you know, biometrics, random face recognition and all of those uh, clicks that they take, where does that data sort of land and uh, what purpose it is used for? And unfortunately, this is despite India sort of six years back in 2017 having the uh, landmark judgment on the right to privacy passed by the Supreme Court of India, which sort of gave a very spectacular turn to the um, jurisprudence on fundamental rights, where the Supreme Court tied the right to privacy with the right to life, liberty, and dignity, and sort of reading it uh, as an important facet to ensuring equality and freedom of speech and expression. And also at the same time placing, you know, people at the heart of new age policy making, but we've seen not enough happening on this trend. Um, but one is going to be positive with like new data protection act coming into place and all of that. But one important thing that the Supreme Court categorically mentioned over there was that privacy cannot be used to further systemic inequalities. Now, what that means is that everyone recognizes the fact that automation is, is not creating something new. It is, it is often exaggerating, which already is pervasive and exists in the society. And we all know that the kind of uh, societies that we live in are not exactly balanced. And we have a range of inequality sort of, you know, within our societies already deeply entrenched. So I think the main problem then is not the way um, 
you know exactly we we shouldn't really like what i want to say we shouldn't really go to automation but to like take a step back and see like what how do we really understand crime and criminality as a concept to really go back over there and start from there that uh, if automation is just a tool to exaggerate everything then should we like take a step back and then try and see what are our misunderstandings and misconceptions on what is really a crime made up because if you see all these cctvs and all of this gadget and stuff is really being uh, bring into force to handle petty crimes uh, on the street right in a very uh, set place um, you know where they're saying okay the you're putting in so much of resources money and effort to handle this one type of crimes but is that what contributes to the larger you know criminality in the society what is the percentage of it where is this kind of like a uh, behavior of the state or of the private sector in conjunction with the state leading us to create what kinds of society so in that sense i think if we go back to just see that uh, every state is a way of defining their uh, crime and criminality and uh, we can all i think uh, come together to on this understanding that a lot of the people that we look as criminals are often people from uh, these historically marginalized communities uh, people who come from below the poverty line people who have already experienced and lived um, in equal treatment from the state and from the society there are certain religious castes and sects who suffer already these kind of discrimination and that kind of social inequality then sort of high, gets highlighted through technology and even exaggerated and entrenched and the fear is that a lot of these inequalities through the use of all these automated techniques that beth also talked about they sort of will regularize get regularized into the way things will function going forward so i think the million dollar question then is that the fact who is going to make that assessment that the kind of uh, crimes we are trying to handle are they the real crimes or uh, i'm not taking up the fact that maybe you know some of this should not be done but to what end and for what purpose another thing that we all sort of know is the reason some of this act is being put together is that you know uh, to check people's behavior and you know that sort of um, understanding seems to develop and even become popular that if you sort of check somebody's behavior then good behavior will get internalized if you're constantly being surveilled and I'm, you know one cannot deny this completely because yes we've seen a lot of studies which support that constant surveillance might sort of create a dent in creating good behavior and some sort of internalization can happen but again then i would go back to the same question that you know how much of these kind of crimes which are getting corrected through this behavioral uh, surveillance um we're trying to tackle and what are these crimes and are there bigger crimes like financial crimes and everything which needs maybe more attention so uh, maybe what needs to be looked at are we trying to plug small loopholes and small gaps and turning a blind eye to like those big cracks and holes which are sort of getting deeper and wider and the fact that you know one important aspect of criminality and crime is that is crime generally as a concept behavioral or structural i think if we can go back to thinking that because my limited understanding of the whole issue is that crime is generally structural it is not behavioral and there are a lot of studies at least that i'm aware of in the indian context written by people um across civil society uh, and one work which i'd love to highlight of a colleague shivangi narayan in the indian scenario who did like an ethnographic study of one of the states in india uh, which is the national capital delhi where she uh, you know categorically gets into how policing and construction of the idea of criminality impacts the society and why we define and decide to employ certain kind of measures and how they do not really work for creating a better society or rendering a better society but it's actually just the opposite so in that sense i think we need to go back to some of these um ontological and taxonomical related questions and then assess where are we moving towards and why are we moving towards that role and i think civil society's role is extremely important it's often of course working in its own uh, silos like 
within civil society, academics are sort of working within that um, closed space. Lawyers are, you know, with themselves. The larger NGO system, uh, you know, working in their own space. I think a lot of like conversations with each other is important so that you can share work and build a better understanding. For example, lawyers might be looking at laws that exist um, even till date, despite India having the landmark judgment on right to privacy six years back. A lot of, uh, you know, the way things are getting defined in India in terms of surveillance still is getting decided by predated laws um, uh, to this Puttaswami judgment. And even after that, you know, we don't see much change sort of happening. At the same time, if lawyers working on these kind of laws and understanding are talking with people like NGOs who are looking into ground research, who understand how, you know, these marginalized and vulnerable communities really get impacted and bring out those instances and experiences in conjunction with their study on secondary research and laws and policy framing. I think that will help us build a clearer picture and better resources. Um, one of the reasons is one of the reason could also be that you know these kind of issues now will sort of help us go towards this direction. And another thing is, I think conferences and discussions like the one that uh, you know Heliosa and Barbara are hosting, which is allowing people from different geographies and people across the world and the Southern Belt and global majority come together to discuss these issues and figure out okay, these are the similarities and these are the divergences because often my understanding is a lot of similarities and synergies and experience, shared experiences that we go through in the kind of similar social, political and cultural context that we have in this part of the world. So it will be fabulous, I think, in terms of growing together and understanding and learning from each other's experiences, how, what we can change and how we can look at the subject. I stop there and happy to come and meet again. Thank you, Swati. Uh, thank you for the the rich reflections uh, you have made. Uh, now I will pass the word to Yazodara Cordova, who is representing the private sector. Yazodara is the principal privacy researcher at Unico Idetech a biometric identity company. She has worked with various organizations such as the World Bank, the United Nations, Harvard University, and TikTok on projects related to digital citizenship, online security, and civic engagement. Thank you so much for joining us today, Yazodara, and the floor is yours. Uh, right, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in any event that the Internet Lab invites me. And I have just a little bit of information to add. The first one that I would like to, to feature is that I know that we navigate the intricacies of identification technologies. So I wanted, I, I want to delve into the nuanced distinctions between biometrics and facial recognition. And uh, because it's where the question of user control takes the center stage. So biometrics as a, a comprehensive concept involves recognizing individuals through unique uh, physiological or behavioral attributes such as finger, fingerprints or iris scans, for example. Uh, Crucially, what sets biometrics apart is the insistence on user consent or authorization. So, for example, uh, in countries where there is a wide um, amount of people that have no uh, digital literacy, it's easier to use their biometrics to buy or, or have access to benef social benefits or even to complete transactions uh, using their own identity. If they're using biometrics, then keeping passwords, for example, because uh, it's safer. So I think when you call biometrics, you have to also emphasize the import importance of user control over the data collected about them. You can, uh, the users are seeing that their data is being collected and they're using this biometrics because they want to open up a set of opportunities that they didn't have before because 
they couldn't keep their passwords safe or they couldn't use the system because it was too complicated. And uh, in contrast, facial recognition, which is a subset of biometrics, hinges on the analysis of facial features for identification. Uh, this method can operate without uh, explicit user consent or even awareness. So it raises concerns about privacy and freedom of expression uh, and personal control. So here the crucial point emerges. Uh, user control is paramount. The fact that entities like law enforcement can retain and edit, edit videos recorded by body cams, for example, underscores the potential misuse of data. So the, pow the power to control such sensitive information should ideally rest with a neural third, neutral third party, uh, uh, citizens, councils, something like this, at the very least, um, pre to preserve the user uh, the user's autonomy over their own identity. So preserving user control becomes not just a matter of privacy, but a safeguard against potential misuse. And it's not an expensive safeguard. Uh, it highlights the need for robust ethical frameworks and regulations, but also highlights the need of putting the data in control of those who actually are uh, the origin of the data, if you're talking about biometrics. Um, so you could give, uh, you, we could create rules, as uh, international rules, or talk about rules that could separate those, those two types of uh, uh, different types of uh, technologies, of identification technologies, so that we could have better frameworks to protect people that are being uh, filmed, having their biometrics, their facial uh, uh, biometrics collected, like for example, Clearview AI, and uh, kind of demand that these companies uh, have a way to inform the users that their data is being collected and offering an option for these users to withdraw the, uh, the consent or withdraw the permission of these companies to negotiate this data or to collect or to keep this data in their user base and their uh, database uh, instead of just, uh, how can I put this? Instead of just assuming that this is an impossible, an impossible question. Uh, there is use to biometrics uh, Biometrics is already being used to create opportunities in some countries and make technology better and safer. But this is not going to happen if the user is not part of the decisions over their own data. So I think the crucial um, conversation should be around, not should not be around the type of data that is being collected because it could be biometrics, or it could be very sensitive type of data that is being collected, and you are not um, aware of that. So I think control is more important than uh, it's a more important question right question right now than uh, who controls this data is more important than what type of data is being collected. And um, I think that's it. <laughs> And uh, this is also a solution um, that can reach the end users and kind of help us build trust and give back the control to the users. I think that's what I, I had to say. I'm happy to take questions or feedbacks later, feedback later if you have, and that's it. Thank you so much, Zadara. Uh, so now we are we have around nine minutes. So I will quickly open the floor to those who are here and may have a question. I will ask you to come close to the table to get a microphone, and we will do a quick round of 
interventions. For those who are online and have any questions or interventions, please write this on the, ch on the chat. We have someone here who will get this. And after that, we'll do a quick round of wrap up with our speakers. So we do have two questions here, please. Um, thank you for sharing your very interesting thoughts uh, about the data security and who should control the data. I would like to hear your opinion on the, on the blockchain technology. How and whether do you think that, that the blockchain would be a solution for specifically collecting the biometric data? Um, do you think that might be a solution to just help to control the access to the data, the blockchain technology itself? Thank you. I think we have another question there. Uh, yeah. Uh, my question pertains to uh, India, essentially. Uh, there is uh, a very recent development just this earlier year, uh, earlier in this year, where it was known, made known to the public that uh, there is something called real-time surveillance happening. Uh, and this was in a reply to a right to information uh, request. And the reply was from the Internet Service Providers Association. So in, in light of this, um, with our act having come into play, uh, which is yet to come into force, but my question is, are there any safeguards that the speakers would like to uh, highlight uh, I understand uh, one such safeguard was just mentioned, but in terms of the others for protecting uh, users and giving them certain actionable rights, for instance, um, even being made aware of all the data that is being processed and even a notice showing that they are under surveillance in public areas, uh, specific to public areas this is. So uh, just need, I wanted your thoughts on that. Thank you. So now I think we have one question on the chat. Um, we have one, one question online from Ayawale Shebeshi. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, from Australia, from civil society. And the question is, increased advanced technologies such as AI, blockchain, EOT, IOT, NFC, NFT, QC. Increase private surveillance in public spaces. All these technologies are creating big data information. And these days, data and information are wealth. The wealth accumulated uh, in developed nations. All these technologies perform activities and services via the internet. So the question is, what will be the solution for end users? So far, that's the only question we have in the chat. So. So thank you. I will get back to our speakers and do a quick round of wrap up. Uh, and I will ask you if you want to add any considerations, any final considerations, and uh, any considerations you may have on how regulation and policy in general can work to address these concerns also. And please. Please feel free to pick the question that you feel most comfortable to answer, so you don't need to answer at all. So I will start back with uh, Beth. Sure. Um, so uh, difficult questions there, but um, I think um, on the question of um, types of safeguards, it definitely does depend on what type of tech we're talking about. So um, I agree, I would distinguish, I'm um, following up on Yasudara's remarks, not just between facial recognition and other forms of biometrics, but also between biometric identification and biometric surveillance, right? The things you were talking about would mainly fall under biometric identification, where users um, basically intentionally use a certain um, physical aspect as the way to access a space or access their account um, or it, what have you within a particular system. Um, and in that context, I think it, it's easier to apply the consent framework. Of course, there are also other forms of biometric surveillance besides spatial recognition. 
um, that are very hard to opt into like voice recognition or gate recognition, um, something like a fingerprint, I think, I, you know, that's the one I am willing to actually use on my phone and my computer. It's um, slightly harder for someone to kind of get from you unawares. Um, so would agree with that distinction. Um, and I think um, that you're, there are certainly, it's a different question. So when we're talking about biometric identification, I think there are indeed valid purposes for it, but there's a really heightened need to establish appropriate safeguards because sometimes even if you're giving it over for a legitimate reason right now, it can end up later on in the hands of entities who you would prefer not to have it. And unlike a password, you can't change your fingerprint as easily. And I do think that's a fundamental distinction there, but I would agree that identification versus surveillance um, is important. Um, and um, in terms of blockchain, um, I, I'm less of an expert on blockchain instinctively. I think um, putting sensitive data in a system that is designed to be unerasable is um, a move that we should definitely think twice about, um, but uh, open to arguments on that one. Um, and real-time surveillance, finally, I think that is really the hardest thing to put safeguards around. And that's why a lot of European digital rights groups in the context of the EU AI Act have been arguing that that's something that should simply be banned, having constant awareness of who's going in and out of public spaces. I think at the very least, you need to delete any data that is collected that way very clearly um, and definitely agree with the suggestion of making people aware of when they're being surveilled and what information about them the government possesses um, in systems that have very, in, in settings that have very elaborate e-government systems like Estonia, that's actually part of the safeguards that are built in to ensure trust. Um, so that, it, that could certainly be part of the answer. Um, I do not have uh, the comprehensive uh, solution, unfortunately, to uh, the challenge of emerging emerging technologies and surveillance. Otherwise, I could uh, write one report and go home. Thank you, Ben. I think uh, none of us has the solution. So thank you, actually, for all your contributions. And I will pass now to Swati. Thank you, Elisa, and you rightly say that uh, none of us have the solution, but good that at least we're coming together to discuss this and sort of at least think of ways that we can uh, work together for a better response in society. Um, I think Beth talked a lot about blockchain, and you know, my next panel right after this is on blockchain. Those interested, please join us there. Um, but I'll, I'll speak to the point on the consent and notice uh, issue. I think again, you know, maybe this is how my brain's wired in the last few days that I want to step back and really look at some of the issues or the um, concepts that we're bringing in the digital era uh, of policy making and regulation is that notice and consent, how, how is somebody who is um, from these vulnerable and marginalized communities or even people like us who we call ourselves an educate, uh, you know, spectrum class of people, we really don't have, a lot of us, you know, really don't have the digital literacy. Like I would say for myself, I don't have enough of financial literacy despite being educated. I really think that is the main issue that the government's doing barely about anything. Um, in terms of using the word empowerment, of course, that's very rife and it's, you know, uh, used across all sorts of regulations and everything. But for somebody to use and implement and understand notice and consent, we need some level of that, um, you know, digital literacy. Uh, people wouldn't even recognize, I think, harms when, when they sort of happen to them. So I kind of feel that a lot of like technology that is being used in the name of trust and everything should be focused towards building privacy and security by design with the kind of uh, communities and the public that we have uh, and the kind of work that we need to build on digital skilling and understanding should be taken much more seriously. And I think that's where the CSOs are playing a massive role. Um, and just to give an example, like we at the Center for Communication Governance, we've, we've been building this privacy law library which traces 
privacy jurisprudence across 17 18 jurisdictions uh, in the world we also do like a regional high court tracker where in we sort of map what is india sort of looking at in terms of privacy and the expanding rights over there how is it tackling this is to and we also do capacity building for like not just students and professional but also for judges and bureaucrats because a lot of these people who will now come into enforcing and implementation of the new act and everything really don't understand the nuts and bolts of how to go about things so india and i think a lot of similar countries are jumping directly to like a privacy 3.0 4.0 situation where they've really not lived through uh it gradually as europe and some of these other countries uh live right so i think we have to be cognizant of that kind of a socio cultural uh, political environment and then think of ways that will fit into our specific um you know pegs and not just like copy paste thank you swari uh now we'll pass first to yazodara and then to barbara so we can close the session due to time constraints we won't be able to take any more questions i know there is someone uh online with their uh hands up but uh we really need to close the session but i do encourage you to get in touch uh both with us and with our other speakers online Uh, please, Yazu. I'll be real quick. I promise. <laughs> so I think we find ourselves in an era where data is amassed indiscriminately, not just uh, biometrics data, and uh, this is propelled by both industries and governments. There, there is a demand for data. Uh, so amidst this deluge of information. Maintaining and uh, assuring the integrity of personal. identifiable information has become increasingly expensive it's a daunting task so this intricacies of structuring and cleaning data which are integral steps in the machine learning cycle uh, they are a challenge and uh, this process is undeniably among the most expensive activities in in this machine learning process so i propose a pivotal shift in in focus towards the user control we know that you can control what you don't see and this resonates in the realm of data privacy because if we need permission or consent over a data set we need to make sure this data set belongs to that person so uh, if we demand this through a regulation we might end up compelling both governments and and industries to bring light to their data practices so this shift is not merely about implementing complex blockchain solutions it's a call to collaborate to to build transparent systems uh, that are hand in hand with regulation the regulators and technologists of course we we will still have lots of work to do even though we can conceive such systems that can be transparent transparent uh, over user data um, but it's crucial to recognize that transparency is the bedrock upon which user control stands so it's not just a technological challenge i know it's a societal demand it's a societal imperative and i i i believe that we have to work collaboratively to shape a future where individuals have a, a meaningful say in how their data is utilized but this for real like in systems and uh, where ethical considerations guide technology as a a a, a feature uh, backlog towered the responsible and sustainable data driven future i guess so that's it um well i think that and swati and yazaraya already answered a lot of what i was wanting to say but i think when we are talking about solutions and regulations especially in the case of Brazil i think the 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 appeal for private surveillance solutions from population in general comes from a place of insecurity and not trusting the public government solutions and they look for it in a way to like overcome their their lack of security felt in general 
And I think this comes from the solution would be societal, as 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 I mentioned, in the sense that this would also require a big level of trust of the people in general into the public institutions. And I think when we are talking about regulation also, especially in Brazil, we have a lack of regulation regarding the use of technology and data collection for um, for public sec public security purposes. And not that these, these private companies actually do public security because they are private solutions and, and then they are not exactly providing public security, but I think when we when we ask them what they are doing, they can use the argument of public security. So I think it's a tricky it's a tricky scenario. It's a tricky regulatory scenario, and I think in Brazil we have a lot to develop yet in the sense. And I think there are many room for more guarantees and for more legal guarantees regarding it. And um, I think well it should be awareness should be also raised in the sense that uh, the people that acquire these, these solutions are also informed on what are the risks and what are the grounds in which these companies can share data with public authorities and who might have access to it. And well, I think that's it. I'm not sure if I added much to the discussion, but I would like to thank you both for for coming, um, and especially for the time zones, which I know it weren't uh, so good for everyone. But thank you so much, and that's it. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for our speakers, uh, for all the contributions, and for having joined us today. And thank you for everyone who. We're here today, both in person and online, and who made uh, excellent contributions. And thank you. I hope you continue to have a great IGF. <laughs>